Hi, I'm Dr. David Dobson. Welcome to Conversations. Today, my guest is Catherine Liao. Catherine is a research associate at the Center for Justice, Equity, and Sustainable Action at the University of the Fraser Valley. She is pursuing her PhD in nursing at the University of British Columbia. Her PhD research focuses on burn injury in underserved communities. We will discuss Catherine's PhD research today. It's a great pleasure to have you with me today, Catherine. Thanks, Dr. Dobson, for inviting me to this conversation circle. I look forward to sharing some of my work. To start off, can you explain what a burn injury is? Absolutely. So I think everybody knows what a burn injury is in the common sense, um, but more sort of using technicality. Um, so a burn injury is an injury to the skin or other organic tissue, primarily caused by heat or due to radiation, radioactivity, electricity, friction, or contact with any chemicals. And thermal or heat burns occurs when some or all of the cells in the skin or other tissues are destroyed by either hot liquid, as we know, hot solid, so contact burns, and flames, so flame burns. And burns are typically classified as first, second, and third degree burn, depending on how deep and how severe they penetrate to the skin surface. And so first degree burns are typically superficial burns affecting only the epidermis or the outer layer of the skin. And the burn site is usually red, painful, dry, with no blisters. So an example would be a mild um, you know, sunburn. And then second degree burn, which is partial thickness burn, it involves the epidermis and part of the dermis layer of the skin. So the burn side appears quite red, blistered, and it may also be swollen and painful. Mm -hmm. And third degree burn, which is the full thickness burn, it destroys the epidermis mm -hmm. and it can also destroy underlying bones, muscles, and tendons. And this burn side can also appear white or charred. So there's no sensation in this area since the nerve endings are destroyed. Okay. That's in a nutshell. <laughs> okay. What draw your interest to burn injuries? Um, so maybe I'm going to give you some sort of statistics around burns before I kind of respond to that question. So we know um, from WHO that an estimated 180,000 deaths occur, you know, are caused by burns. Mm -hmm. And the vast majority of them occur in low middle income countries. And non-fatal burn injuries are sort of the leading cause of more morbidity such as physical disability, chronic pain, PTSD, and contractures if they're untreated, and the recovery process can be long. So for example, in India, over 1 million people can are moderately or severely burnt every year, mm -hmm. and nearly 173,000 children in Bangladesh are moderately or severely um, burnt every year as well. Mm -hmm. And Places like Bangladesh, Colombia, Egypt, Pakistan, 17% of children with burns have a temporary disability and 18% have a permanent disability. So in Canada, we don't have a national burns registry, so we don't really have much information about the sort of landscape of who gets burned, how they get burned, you know, and what's the sort of statistics. Mm -hmm. But provincially, I think that everybody, you know, maintains some sort of data. So in BC, as I was analyzing the data set, in BC, BC Burns Registry basically um, collates all these information. And so from my preliminary analysis, approximately 0.03% of British Columbians get burned requiring hospital treatment. Okay. So as an ICU nurse um, at the UK and even in Canada, I looked after a patient, a elderly patient with burns, a third degree burn on their torso, arms and legs. Mm -hmm. And basically this patient fell asleep just hugging a radiator. And so at the time, I remember, because this is me like maybe 18 years ago, uh -huh. you know, around that time, uh -huh. you know, when the medical team was like, well, you know, people should know better. They shouldn't be hugging the radiator to sleep. And, you know, that was also my mindset, that sort of biomedical model of making sense of health and health. Yeah. But then as I reflected, I remember, you know, listening on the news, reading on the newspaper that how senior population at that time was actually suffering from economic burden, mm -hmm. not having adequate income. Mm -hmm. And people were actually turning down the heating, you know, in the house mm -hmm. that they could mm -hmm. save some money. And so that really sort of clicked on me like, yeah, this, mm -hmm. this patient was probably saving money mm -hmm. and using portable heaters to keep themselves warm. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, this patient also had diabetes, which means they mm -hmm. suffer from peripheral neuropathy, mm -hmm. which 
you know, um, lack of sensation to yeah. sort of thermal um, changes. So yeah. that really sort of shifted my biomedical model of looking at things yeah. from a more sort of sociological, psychosocial aspect yeah. and social determinants yeah. of health. And similarly, I spent some time in Sierra Leone. I lived there for two years um, mm -hmm. working as a volunteer nurse educator. Mm -hmm. And I met many burn survivors. Mm -hmm. um, many of them didn't even have burns care because in Sierra Leone at that time, we didn't have any sort of, we didn't have a health system that supported burns care. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the patients with burns were left untreated. Mm -hmm. I distinctly remember there was this seven-year-old girl that I cared for with burns in her arm. Mm -hmm. And she had basically, you know, her family had taken her to the tribal doctors and they treated the, the burns, but it got infected because it wasn't, you know, there was no skin graft or debridement. And so the wound got infected and, it, you know, eventually she ended up having her arms amputated. So can you imagine as a child, you have your arm amputation, you know, the sort of stigma, the physical um, body image, all of those issues. So it had an economic and social burden as well. Mm -hmm. And I think that was the sort of change in my mindset about looking at health mm -hmm. as a human right. right. So that's what sort of took um, started my interest in burns. Okay. Your PhD research focuses on burn injuries in underserved communities in British Columbia. Uh, please share what your research is about. Sure. I'm so I'm going to start from the beginning because I always like to go from the storytelling, right? Yes. So I collaborated on a study with the National Indigenous Fire Safety Council and um, Canada Statistics. And it was basically a study looking at mortality, morbidity related to fire, burns and carbon monoxide yeah. poisoning among First Nations people, yeah. Métis, Inuit in Canada. Okay. And the study finding really sort of shocked me. Yeah. It showed that Indigenous people are over five times more likely to die in a fire and this number increases to over 10 times more for First Nations people living on reserves. Mm. Inuits are over 17 times more likely to die in a fire than non-Indigenous people. Mm. Similarly, in my clinical practice, I've come across patients who are unhoused or who lives in you know, precarious housing, having burn injuries or post-burn wounds that were infected because of the environment where they lived. Mm. And it's coming back to hospital for sort of, you know, um, mm. infection or treatment. Mm. Mm. And it really made me think about how do certain population in Canada, particularly in BC, access post-burns care? Like, you know, we're very good at treating the acute symptoms in hospital, mm. but we're not very good at looking at prevention or even rehabilitation, right? The way the healthcare system mm. or the healthcare model is built. Mm. So that really sort of these experiences really piqued my curiosity in exploring the inequities like why are certain population disproportionately mm -hmm. impacted by fire events and suffer you know burn injuries because mm -hmm. burn injury is not just about getting injured right mm -hmm. if you suffer mm -hmm. severe burn injuries it's the aftermath that recovery mm -hmm. so long mm -hmm. the recovery requires physiotherapy occupational therapy yeah. even sort of you know mental health counseling because it's mm -hmm. traumatic yeah. but we know that some of these populations don't have access to these services either because of their geographical location because of the remoteness mm. or some people experience more stigma coming into care mm. and that sort of marginalization so mm. that's what sort of piqued my interest and because I am as a nurse I'm really focused on social justice and mm. promoting equity in healthcare as much as we can in the little ways that we can mm. so that's what led me to this um, research topic and also my experience working in Sierra Leone and, you know, um, trying to boost burns care in low middle income countries. So, yeah, so that's sort of what took me down yeah. this path. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And David, like also sometimes, you know, the language of injuries often blame, like, you know, well, you should be more careful or oh, you should be doing this. Yeah. But we often fail to look at the structural, the system level sort of yeah. um, barriers that are creating yeah. these yeah. You know, inequities. Yeah. Yeah. What are the prevention strategies that we we mm. take? Because sometimes we use this one size that fits all approach mm. and think that everybody has the same understanding yeah. of prevention, yeah. you know, um yeah. sort of programs. But we yeah. need to be more, you know, culturally safe, more culturally, you know, more contextual yeah. and also looking at the sort of sociopolitical uh, yeah. factors and yeah. economic factors, right? Yeah. yeah. And the yeah. social determinants of yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. injuries. Yeah. 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 Sorry to button, but I think it's also so true. Like the sort of injury language can be 
mm. almost stigmatizing as well and mm. stereotyping because often you'll find well, what I've found in my literature review you know a lot of the literature speaks about well alcohol substance use mm. other factors causing burns but not really looking at for example you know when I worked the study with um, the National Indigenous Fire Safety Council Mm. Yes, First Nations community are more at risk, but we're not asking the questions such as why are they more at risk? Like, you know, mm. maybe because they don't have a fire hall within, yeah. um, you yeah. know, sort of approachable yeah. distance yeah. or reachable distance, yeah. or maybe they don't get house insurance because they don't have a fire hall or a fire hydrant, yeah. or yeah. maybe they don't even have, you know, Alarms. like high pressure um, yeah. water to yeah. extinguish the fire, right? Yeah. yeah. And the yeah. sort of the jurisdictional neglect and all of those yeah. things how colonization has played a part. So yeah. looking at the broader factors, not yeah. just personal, individual, yes. you know, level of why people are getting burned. Yeah. You are using critical ethnography for your PhD research. Can you share a little bit about your research methodology? Yeah, so I use um, critical ethnography because of my um, philosophical belief. Okay. about you know using research as a transformative tool yeah. coming from that sort of social justice transformative lens yeah. so i feel like when we as you know as a using critical ethnography will force me to use those principles when i'm analyzing my data or when i'm you know conducting participant observation how power is played in those um, situation yeah. so as part of my um data collection i am doing document analysis so mm -hmm. analyzing lots of policies um, yeah. reports, you know, the news that we see, any sort of literature that I can really um, scrutinize yeah. in terms of where are the gaps? What is it that we're missing? Yeah. And I'm also conducting participant observations. So mm -hmm. the past six weeks, I've been following the Vancouver Fire Rescue Department mm -hmm. in downtown Eastside. Mm -hmm. So I'm shadowing a team that goes and does fire inspection, fire mm -hmm. prevention, safety in these single room occupancies. Yeah homeless encampment to see actually what are the factors, the environmental factors that are causing these higher fire events or higher fire, you know, fire call outs. Yeah. And I'm hoping that I'm um, maybe in the new year, I'll be shadowing some first nation leaders in their communities that have experienced a higher um, fire incidents. Okay. So that's my part of spent observation part. Okay. And then I will also be doing some qualitative interviews with burn survivors and yeah. community leaders and care providers who work in these areas. What have you learned from your research so far? Um, learned from my research or as a researcher, maybe? Yeah. So what I've learned as a researcher is I, I consider myself to be a pracademic. Okay. I feel like I, I've come into research at a very later stage in my career. Like I've been a nurse for 22 years. Okay. Um, and it's only now that I've, you know, really understand research and not shying away from research. So I feel... If I was to share a message, I would be like, well, you know, it's never too late um, mm. to really embark on this research yeah. interest and curiosity. Yeah. Um, I would also say, you know, the commitment to using research as a transformative tool mm -hmm. and also being um, encouraging community participatory researchers, because often we find that, you know, mm -hmm. the research is done in silos or done yeah. without the people who are most impacted by those by the issues that we're trying to investigate yeah, so yeah. yeah like those would be some of the research things that i've learned through the through my research okay. and obviously i'm still in the middle of data collection so i'll share more about my my own research when i'm done yeah so when i started um before the ethics approval obviously building community relationship was very important yeah because i was doing participant observation i needed yeah. to be welcome in that yeah. space so building those network and yeah. Having their like the community partner support is yeah. very crucial because yeah. in order to show that you know your research is going to be successful, you need to have the buy-in of community leaders. Mm -hmm. So I felt like maybe that stage was the most important stage for me, mm -hmm. and it really helped me um, learn how to network and how to sort of um, ask the right questions so that I would get their approval and get the support then I can show ethics like look I have, yeah. I have the communities yeah. and support so that was an important learning for me yeah. so I feel like yeah starting those network and relationship building from the very beginning yeah. is very crucial yeah uh, Catherine you are also involved in a charity uh, research Africa 
please share with us a little bit about this nonprofit and and what you do. This is a long story. Um, so as you know, I spent two years in Sierra Leone um, volunteering as a nurse educator back in 2011. Okay. Um, and during my time, I met, like I said, met a lot of patients with burn injuries. Yeah. And I also met this team called Research Africa. And at that time, it was Mr. Martin Webster. He's like a renowned reconstructive um, mm. and burn surgeon. Mm. And he basically invited me to, you know, support the, the charity. Mm. So in 2013, I joined as the director and then subsequently as vice mm. chair. Mm. And so what we do at Research Africa is we're focused on sort of strengthening health systems to support burns care. And the way we do that is by focusing on training, education, scholarship, you know, and fellowship. Yeah. So, for example, um, in Sierra Leone, when we didn't have burns um, specialists, we now have two very first um, Sierra Leone's first burn surgeon. So the two trainees that we had in our program right. have now come back to Sierra Leone to run their own burns, you know, um, services. Right. And all of the student nurses that I used to teach in when I was volunteering, they've become nurses and they've gone on to become burn specialist um, nurses. Right. And I know some of them have even gone to um, do physiotherapy. So now they become physiotherapists and even a nurse anesthetist focusing on pain. Yeah. So um, we call them the research family. Mm -hmm. So all of these key people are now back in Sierra Leone and now they're run, ready to run their own, you know, um, burns care services. And more recently, one of the petroleum company, a Sierra Leonean petroleum company, Leonco, they pledged to build a burns unit in Freetown. So that will be the country's first burns unit. Nice. Um, we're hoping by maybe March 2024, it will be ready. And then that's when we will, you know, start um, really looking at how do we now equip this burns unit yeah. and looking at how do we strengthen health systems in Sierra Leone to support this burns unit. Yeah. So we're working very closely, like with the Ministry of Health and all our colleagues in Sierra Leone. Yeah, yeah. So it definitely is a, a very important subject area. Thank you for your time, Catherine. Have a great rest of your day. Well, thank you for having me on your show. I appreciate it.